going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. All members will raise their right hand. You From the halls of Congress in Washington to the meeting room of the Hamilton County Courthouse, this was a week of new beginnings, of new possibilities. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. A new year signals a new start in the halls of Congress and in Hamilton County Commission. That's our focus this morning. We all know that with the necessary give and take of conflicting needs, values, and interests, things will get bogged down in the messy reality of making policy and legislation soon enough. But this week, it's worth focusing on the vision of those who the voters have chosen and entrusted with the responsibility to shape the future. In the second half of the program, I'll be joined by, by Pat DeWine, who announced a reform theme for Hamilton County when he was sworn in this past week. But we begin this morning with Congressman Rob Portman, a Republican who represents Ohio's 2nd Congressional District. Rob has served in Congress for a decade. He is a member of the powerful Ways and Means Committee and the Budget Committee. He also chairs the House Leadership Committee and in that capacity serves as the liaison with the Bush White House. Rob, welcome back to Newsmakers. Great to be on with you, Dan. I, is Powerful Ways and Means Committee, is that part of the name, Powerful? I the chairman know. likes to always include that whenever he has the Ways and Means Committee. <laughs> the fact is, it's the committee that raises your taxes or lowers them, so in that sense it's powerful. Okay, yeah, N nobody's doubting that. By the way, something that we're taping on Friday, something that happened on Thursday in yeah. Congress, which I want to make sure people uh, know about, is something, uh, a bill that changes tax deductions during January retroactively uh, to last year That's because correct. of charitable contributions. Right. Can you explain that? Sure. For folks who want to make a charitable contribution for the tsunami relief effort, they now have until the end of January to make it an 04 tax year deduction, which is a great incentive. You know, a lot of people wait till the end of the year to make their contributions to charitable organizations to get that deduction. Now they can do that until the end of January. So that should even increase the hundreds of millions of dollars, Dan, that's already being given by private individuals. You know, the United States of America once again is taking the lead in responding to an humani a humanitarian crisis overseas. We've gotten some flack. Uh, some officials at the U.N. and elsewhere have said that the U.S. hasn't been generous enough. Well, I think we have been and are continuing to be. The government is doing their part, about $350 million of direct aid, a lot of military aid. Uh, for instance, we've got over 20 ships now in that area of South Asia, marine contingent and so on. But I think most of the aid will end up coming from private individuals. Once again, people are being very generous. and. Money is what's needed. It's, uh, it's important to get the money to the affected areas right what away. What is this contingent on? Do you have to give to an organization that is clearly involved in tsunami relief, so the Red Cross or the United Nations or something like that? That's correct. Okay, so as yeah. long as it's involved with tsunami relief. The Red Cross or the Red Crescent, uh, uh, Matthew 25 Ministries here locally, the Islamic Center here locally is accepting contributions. Be sure you put on the memo, the check, that it's okay. for tsunami earthquake relief. There are plenty of good organizations out there. Uh, there's a national website you can go on to through the U.S. government. I wish I had the yeah, that's name, name with me, but if you want to check out any of these organizations, feel free to call me. Call our office at 791-0381. We'll help you check out the groups. Be sure the money's going to a legitimate group, but there are plenty of groups out there that are doing the right thing with this money. They're getting the money directly into these areas, and that's what they need right now. There's not time enough, frankly, okay. to get the clothing and the food and so on. It's more getting the cash to these people. Let's get on to some other issues. There's a lot of priorities that have been mentioned as for this 109th Congress. Social Security reform, uh, income tax reform, mm -hmm. tort reform, making tax cuts permanent. Mm -hmm. Lots of things have been mentioned. What do you think are the real priorities? What is a, we all know you're going to get into this and there's going to be grinding and yeah. yeah. What, 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 what are the top priorities of both the White House and uh, Republican leadership? In well, it's House? tough to get it all done. You talked about that earlier. Right. But the reality is this will be um, a Congress that will attempt to make major reforms in major systems of government. Uh, this is a reform Congress. We're talking about the first Social Security reform really since the 1930s, taking an antiquated system, modernizing it. Right now, as you know, it's a pay-as-you-go system, can't pay for itself because there are fewer of us working as compared to the number of people retired, so we need to make big changes. Taxes, simplifying our tax well, code. Before we get off of, of Social Security, I want to be clear. I know the President supports private uh, accounts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as part of the Social Security system. Mm -hmm. Do you personally support that? Absolutely. I've supported it since I was first elected to Congress. Uh, in fact, I ran on that. I'm glad we're finally getting around to doing it. I've tried over the years, and we haven't had much success. 
Bill Clinton talked about it, as you know, and was pretty close, I think, to moving ahead with that. And then some of the scandals erupted and so on. We ended up getting kind of sidetracked. But it's, a, it's, it's one idea as part of a group of ideas to be sure that you can begin to build up assets and social security in the system that actually saves the system over time. There is a transition financing well, cost to it. Well, that's what I was going to say. Where do we get the money to transition that? Because that's going to be very costly. Yeah. The, the problem with Social Security, just to put it in a big context here, is that it's a pay-as-you-go system, meaning the money you and I pay in through our FICA taxes go to our parents or our grandparents. Right. It doesn't go for us. As a result, when you take some money out of the system for personal accounts, which is a good idea long term because it really does save the system because you get a higher rate of return, you have the money out there working for you but also for the system, but you need to have some way to be sure the flow of benefits continues. Over the short term, it's not a problem because until 2014, there's enough money coming in to pay for the benefits. That's but not it, that far away. But at 2014, the lines cross and you don't have enough taxes coming in to pay for the benefits. So there needs to be a, some transition financing. How much you have to finance, it depends on what else you do with the system. Do you change the benefit formula a little bit? Do you change some of the progressivity Are of the program? Are you willing to see um, income taxed higher higher levels of income right now there's a cutoff is it eighty thousand dollars yeah there's a there's a there's are a you allowed to let that rise are you that's, willing to let that rise that's one of the proposals on the table uh... there are about five of them and that's one that's in a bill in the senate that some folks in the white house have talked favorably about how there's, do you feel about it i'm not sure that makes sense uh... if you do that what you're doing essentially is you're making social security more like a transfer program or a welfare program than you are a program that everybody pays into than everybody gets a benefit out of Right now, Social Security is already progressive. In other words, if you're a lower income American and you pay into Social Security, you get a relatively higher benefit than someone who's a higher income individual who also pays in. But you pay on your entire income. You, yeah, you pay on your entire income, but, but still the, the, the return you get because the formula itself in terms of how you calculate your benefit is, a little, is more progressive. And I think that's okay. But I think in, there's some limit there where you want to be sure everybody has a stake in this and it's viewed as something that's more like a social insurance program. So, but that's one of the ideas on the table. I think it should stay on the table, Dan. The point is we can't continue to fund benefits for our kids and our grandkids under the current system. It won't work without massive tax increases or a massive reduction in benefits. So we need to do something different. Are you willing to see a movement of the retirement age back from whatever, is Possibly. it 67 yeah. now, move that's, it up to 70, it's, given longer lifespans? Yeah, that's already in place, as you know. We're slowly going up right. to age 67. Uh, and that should be on the table as well. Now, these are all different moving parts that will determine how much you have in the transition. But one, one thing I, I, I want to make, uh, one point I want to make, which is sometimes misunderstood about this Social Security reform idea, nobody is talking about reducing the benefits of those people who are retired or those people who are close to retirement. Mm -hmm. They will get the benefits as promised. The guarantee is there. Those benefits will continue. It's about my kids, your kids. It's about the next generation, your grandkids maybe. You know, what will be there for them? I'm not that much older. <laughs> well, someday I hope you have grandkids. <laughs> right. And, you know, when, when that 2014 year hits we talked about, right. there won't be enough taxes coming in to pay for the benefits. Then it begins to really spiral and you get huge insolvencies. So this is, to me, an exciting opportunity to allow people to have a little more control over their own retirement, to fix the system over time, and to help our economy because our savings is one of our problems in our well, economy. It takes, so increased savings. Will it take bipartisan support to get this passed? Last week, yes, your newest Republican colleague, Jeff Davis from Northern Kentucky, said he was opposed to this. Yeah, it'll take partisan and bipartisan support. Uh, it'll take support from across the board because the Senate, as you know, although there are now 55 Republicans because of the filibuster in the Senate, it takes 60 votes, a supermajority, right. to pass anything. I also think it's important that it's a bipartisan because it's a big change to one of our major systems in our country. We'll talk about taxes in a second, but I feel the same way about that. I think when you make a big change like this, it's important. It doesn't have to be a consensus, but it has to be something that's, I think, fairly well understood in Congress is the right way to go. Why? Otherwise, you're going to end up changing it every other Congress every time there's, there's a change. When you make changes like this, they ought to make sense. They ought to be in place for a long period of time for the sake of our country. And, this is a great example of where there is bipartisan support, by the way. There are plenty of Democrats, including Bill Clinton I talked about, mm -hmm. who believed you needed to figure out a third way to get a higher rate of return on Social Security. You mentioned taxes. A number of years ago, you were on this show a couple of times to talk about tax reform. Yeah. I'm not sure any of us have exactly noticed the big change from that joint commission you headed up. Yeah. What about this time? Are we, talking, are we serious about talking about fundamental reform here? And if so, what would fundamental reform look like? I hope we're serious about fundamental reform, but at the least we need to simplify the taxes. 
Last time you and I talked about it, I was heading up the IRS reform effort, and we did reform the IRS. At that time, the IRS was in the basement when you did the little you know, customer satisfaction surveys of federal agencies. <laughs> the IRS was at the bottom of the pile. Now they're about a th a halfway or two-thirds of the way up. Oh, yeah, way. we all love them. Well, well I know. Being, I know. Being, <laughs> being the tax collector isn't, isn't exactly a popular thing. But i got to tell you, in my own office, we get a lot fewer complaints. Mm -hmm. uh, the IRS does work better. Some would say it works too well. Some would say that it's focused too much now on taxpayer rights and not enough on compliance. Mm -hmm. I think maybe the pendulum swung a little too much in some respects, but I'm glad that there are 52 new taxpayer rights, that it's working better. So that's yeah. an example, Dan. I say that because you can go into these systems and make them better. You have to make some tough decisions, what but you kind, can make some decisions. What kind of tax reform are we talking about? Well, first, just simplifying the code. Right now, you've got about $200 billion a year that's being spent to comply with our tax code. It's basically wasted. It's, it's good for tax planners and accountants, although a lot of them would rather be doing something more interesting, frankly. Okay. The alternative minimum tax is a great example of that. More and more Americans are being subject to two tax systems, one, the normal tax system with all its preferences. The other, the alternative minimum tax, mm -hmm. doesn't permit you to take certain preferences. That's an enormous compliance cost. It's also a question of whether that's fair or not. So right now we have a system that doesn't work, that is not good for our economy, that's tough on individuals, and is not going to allow the IRS ever to do a great job because the code's so darn complicated. So we need to simplify it. Is the idea of a European-style value-added tax on the table? It should be. It should be on the table. Uh, why? Because it's a consumption tax. It's basically like the flat tax or like a sales tax. It encourages us to save and invest more because we punish that less mm -hmm. by taxing consumption more than saving and investment and productivity in the next dollar earned. So it would be good for the economy. Second, if you do a VAT tax, you can border adjust. What does that mean? It means when you sell a product out of Cincinnati, Ohio, going over, let's say, to Europe or Asia, you don't have to tax it under the VAT tax, under international rules. On the other hand, when the import comes into the United mm -hmm. States, say from China or from Europe, you can tax it. Every other one of our major trading partners does that with their VAT tax. In China, it's about a 16% average disadvantage if, if you were our companies have. If you were handicapping the chances of a VAT tax over the next, switching to a VAT tax system yeah. over the next four years, how, how much of a chance do you give it? Over the next four years, um, maybe a little under 50-50, but that's pretty good. And, I'd say and, that's and the reason good. I say that is our corporate income tax is also a mess in the sense of the compliance costs are huge mm -hmm. and disadvantages U.S. jobs being created right here, say in Ohio, where we've had job loss in the last several years. If you had a tax system that tax consumption that had this advantage on the international side I talked about, right. it would encourage companies to make that investment here rather than overseas. So instead of the current corporate income tax, if you went to something like this, it might make a lot of sense. I, I want to uh, raise a couple things. In yesterday's Wall Street Journal, yeah. Uh, a friend of yours, Joe Hagan, was mentioned as a possible <laughs> new director of Homeland Security. Yeah. And uh, apparently he's had a great deal of role in putting this together originally. He has. And th they say, they describe, the, the journal describes him as an excellent manager capable of overseeing department shakeup and nominating him would fit the president's pattern of placing trusted White House officials in key cabinet jobs. What do, you th what do you hear? What do you know about this as a possibility? Could He'd be Cincinnati a terrific pick. Be Let's tell people who Joe Hagan is first. Born and raised here in Cincinnati, actually went to Kenyon College in Ohio, signed up with President Bush 41, the first President Bush early on, was his personal aide, went to work for him, then came back here, worked here for a while in Cincinnati, then hooked up with number, number two, George, George Bush 43, ends up as his deputy chief of staff basically for running the operations of the White House. Mm -hmm. Done a great job at that for now four years. Right. And uh, he happens to be a volunteer fireman. He started as a volunteer firefighter here in Cincinnati when he was 16 years old. In Madeira. Um, Ma Ma Madeira Indian Hill Fire Department. Right. Uh, headed up you know, the USAR team right. here, Urban Search and Rescue Team, which is uh, connected with FEMA, the Federal uh, Emergency Management Agency. So Joe's got great experience. He's actually a first responder. And he's a great manager. They, uh, they also, I've, I've, I've been pushing him. I think, I think he'd be a great choice. They also go on to say, though, that the White House wants the next secretary uh, to be a manager with a public persona, someone with brains of Lee Iacocca <laughs> and the body of Clint Eastwood. Is that Maybe the body of Arnold Schwarzenegger would be better than Clint. <laughs> I'm not going to comment about his body because, you know, Joe's actually lost some weight, looking good. Uh, this this would be a great opportunity for him, but more importantly, have you talked to him about the this? country. I have. I've encouraged him to look at it. Uh, 
you know, Joe is kind of a, so do you think he, this he, is he likes a to be in the background more. I think it is a possibility. Okay. I think he'd be a great choice. Again, he understands the needs of the first responders. He is a great manager. That's what he does uh, at the White House, and he's got the trust of the president. That's well, a good combination. One other question, and I'm running out of time, but one yeah. other question. What do you see as your political future? Are you considering, lots of people would say, someone who wants higher office, ultimately, they're better off running for an executive position like governor uh, somewhere in their career. Are you considering coming back to Ohio and running for governor? I'm feeling lucky to be where I am. I mean, honestly, I'm in the middle of in issues that, as you and I talked about, I've worked on ever since I got there, some of which I ran on, like Social Security reform. So I'm, I'm, I'm loving where I am. You, I know, really am. you know all the rumors that were floating around before the election about the Byzantine shifting yeah, there of were offices. Yeah, there were a lot of rumors. I think the Seriously, though, were you, are you considering running for governor? No, no. I think the press was just bored. That's where the governor rumors came from, honestly. Dan, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be doing what I'm doing, honestly. And I'm a congressman from the greater Cincinnati area. I'm not well known in the rest of the state. Uh, I do try to help the state where I can. And I do think Ohio needs some help right now, frankly. Uh, but I think I can do the most good for the most number of people by staying in D.C., helping get this exciting agenda through Congress, helping to pe people simplify their taxes, fix Social Security, tort reform we didn't even talk about. I know. It's on my list, but issues. we're out of time. Uh, trying to get the budget under control, right. getting spending down. I'm going to be vice chairman of the budget committee this year in Congress, which was just so we, announced yesterday. we can call so. you when we care about the budget. Well, call me, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we need to get our spending down, and we need to get the deficit under control. So I got, I got lots on my plate, and I'm pretty excited about that. And I feel like I'm lucky to have this job. I really do. Okay, Rob, thank you for being here. Good luck in this Congress. Thanks, Dan. And uh, I know you've got the ear of the president, so uh, let's use that for, for Cincinnati. Always fun being on with you. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. It's not just Congress that got a fresh start this week. On Monday, Senator Mike DeWine swore in his son, Pat, in a new as the new Hamilton County Commissioner. After the break, looking for models for reform of county governments. Stay tuned. We went to Phoenix and found a, and found a government that, that consistently measured customer satisfaction with their government and used that as a tool for evaluating government, government employees, as a tool for compensating people. Welcome back. For decades, political activists have talked about reforming county government. As the county has assumed responsibility for more and more, from social services to stadiums, increasing efficiency and creating a system that encourages out-of-the-box thinking has become increasingly important. The newest Hamilton County Commissioner enunciated that theme at his swearing-in last Monday. From 1999 through 2004, Pat DeWine served as a member of Cincinnati City Council. As a Republican, he was in a distinct minority and often blocked from implementing programs like managed competition. On the county commission, Pat is a member of the majority party. Pat, welcome back to Newsmakers. Thank Makers. you. Thank you. Um, you and Phil Heimlich visited a number of different counties around, around the country looking for ideas. Uh, what this was one that you talked about. What were the maybe two or three that most impressed you? Well, you know, what, after the election, Phil and I went out. And we we sought to find some of the best run counties in the country and go out and talk to people and see what they were doing. And, you know, what I think what impressed me the most was that they were all doing a lot of the same things. Uh, they were they were doing they were doing things like managed competition for forcing government services to compete with the private sector. They were doing things like gain sharing, where they gave employees a stake in doing a better job by giving them a share of the savings that they generated. And they, they also all had a strong customer service focus, and they all had a, re, a relentless uh, mindset to treat taxpayer dollars with respect and try to run government for less money. Saying that, is that distinctly different from the way, and I know you've only been there a week, but you've been here for, around here for a long time. Uh, is that distinctly different than the way Hamlin County government runs? Yes, it is. So you think there is a lot that can be applied. As you look at Hamilton County government, what, what are some specific, how could you apply some of those principles to some specific functions, offices, services? Right. You know, Hamilton County government has kind of the 
well, this is the way we do it because we've always done it this way mindset. Uh, and it's really, you know, people have been unwilling to think about uh, doing, doing things differently. Uh, a few examples of where I think we can make reforms. Uh, one, this week uh, we announced that uh, we're putting in place a secret shopper program mod modeled on something they've done in Miami-Dade County where they actually have volunteers go to county departments, pretend like they're uh, interested in, in, in county services, and then grade how well the service they, they get from people and use that as a feedback mechanism to improve the way government treats people. Uh, managed competition is another area. We, we went to Charlotte. What they have, they have a citizens committee that's, that has gone through and gone through city services there one by one and see what can be put out for bid. We're going to do the, sa the same thing, the same thing here. Is one of the problems that we face in Hamilton County government when you talked about that uh, secret shopper thing uh, is that the county commission doesn't control county commissioners don't control as much as I think people sometimes right. think they do because there's these separately elected uh, countywide offices and they really run their own shops. Does that limit your ability to implement? I mean, could I go into the clerk, of course, or the recorder's office, come back with a report to you and say, this was not well handled? Can you do anything about it? Well, most of the places we visited actually confronted that same problem, and they had all found ways to deal with it. Uh, you know, we don't run the clerk's office, and, and, and statutorily we can't do that. We don't run the recorder's office. But we, we do set their budgets, and as part of that budget and oversight role, you know, it, it is our responsibility to measure how the services are being provided, what they're doing with the money, so that we can make good budgeting decisions. And, you know, like for this secret shopper program, for example, I int intend, we intend to start out with the departments directly under our control. But we all, we intend to expand it to those other departments as well. What would be a, a department directly under your control that would really touch people's individual, everyday lives? Uh, health and Human Services is certainly one okay. that a lot of people deal with, uh, that people have a lot of complaints with. Okay, so you could come in. Now, would this get down to the level, and I think this is sort of hinted at in that soundbite that we used, that it would get down to the level of actually fitting uh, an employee's compensation to their ability to deliver? It, it, th those are the kind of things that we ultimately have to do. Uh, if you go to Miami-Dade County, they evaluate every employee as, as, as part of how he fits into the, count, the county plan. They have, a county, they have a county plan actually for every single employee. Wow. Uh, and you know, we have to do those kinds of things. number of the places that you said that you had visited, you and Phil had visited, also have countywide government. Are you willing to look at that? Are you willing to talk about that? None, none of the places we visited have countywide government. What they have, I thought Miami Dade did. They, uh, they, they, do, they do not. They have uh, uh, seven different municipalities, uh, inc including the okay. city, the city of Miami. That. But what they all have is they've all been willing to take on and do the tough work of consolidating programs across jurisdictional lines. In Charlotte, in Charlotte, uh, they have merged. Most aspects of government between city and county are actually merged. They have, they have an independent city council and mayor for the city of Charlotte, and they have an independently elected board of commissioners, but they've merged all kinds of services. For example? For example, they even there have a, have a countywide police department. Uh, what, what about things like water, things like um, uh, trash collection? Could they, those they, things be all, those unified? Things, those things have all, all been merged in, in, uh, in Charlotte. Uh, yeah, I, th I think a lot of those things, I think we have to start looking that way. Given the long-term sort of <laughs> contest between the city of Cincinnati and the county, that may pose a difficulty initially. Could you s launch something like that, Unified Services, I beyond the si city of Cincinnati's limits, all the different townships, all the different other municipalities that Hamilton County is just filled with and bogged down with? Well, I, th I think, you know, anything like that is, go is going to have to take the buy-in of, of any jurisdiction. And it's going, to, it's going to have to be voluntary. It's certainly going to be voluntary. We're not, we're going to, sh we're not going to shove right. that kind of stuff down anyone's throat. But I think what we can do is encourage people to work together in ways that create efficiencies. For example, uh, one of the places where I want to start is starting to fix the county building permit system. I know I've heard from numerous uh, citizens complaints about how difficult it has been to get a, a permit from the county. The city, in fact, actually has done some reforms there. Uh, what I would, what we're talking about doing is ultimately putting in place 
uh, what we saw in Miami, which was kind of a virtual permit system, where in Miami-Dade County, someone can actually apply for any type of building permit online. They can, at their computer, they can set up a meeting with a building inspector, and they can also arrange for an inspection within 24 hours. What I want to do is uh, combine the city and county uh, in, in one one-stop center, one virtual thing, and then invite every jurisdiction who issues permits to join with us. Well, we're just out of time, but this is a continuing discussion because this is a new new effort and uh, really look forward to having you back to see how you can implement this on the countywide level. Everybody's going to be looking at this. So congratulations, thank Pat, you. and I uh, look forward to you to come back. Uh, thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the, oh, when my guest will be Jerry Springer. We'll throw a couple of chairs, and he's the newest radio talk jock in Cincinnati and a potential future candidate for governor. Thank you. Have a good week.